And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt keep therefore this ordinance in his season from year to year. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore upon to thee, as he swore unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix. It's the first thing also that emerges out of potential, right? right? Is to open the matrix is the first thing that emerges out of... And the first thing is anomalous and special and unique because it's the first thing that emerges. So there's also that being emphasized there too. So... In the pagan nations, the firstborn was a matter of incredible male pride. Mm -hmm. And it's almost hitting it on the head. The firstborn here, you dedicate to the yeah, Lord. Yeah, well, you see this specialness of firstborns in families, too, because, well, it's the first child, and so that, that's, that's even more remarkable than the next child in some sense, because you've already had a child then, and, and you know, not that you love the second child any less, but that, that well, bloom of, of revelation, that's it, in some sense. The bloom right. of revelation is off the second child. Well, because when, when you have a child and you cross the threshold of being a parent, your entire world and the universe is remade. Right, mm -hmm. right, 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 right. But you look in Genesis, it's very often the second child whom the Lord favors. A absolutely. Well, Always. because you have this, you have yeah. this tension too. Abel, Abel over Cain, right, Jacob, etc. Joseph, no, that's right. Moses. But it's so do you suppose that occurs when the firstborn isn't properly consecrated to God? So the firstborn becomes, well, the firstborn's often an icon of tyranny because he's privileged, because he's the firstborn. He can easily fall into an alliance yeah. with tradition because look at me, tradition favors me, therefore tradition is right. And it's, it's then when the second son becomes favored. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, a, that's also, I, I think that's Adlerian too, right? I mean, it's like the first child fulfills the role in the family and it's like, well, what role's next when you're born next, right? It has to be something innovative or revolutionary. Right, right, right. You don't have a revolutionary first child like you would with Moses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's some evidence for that in the research literature that firstborns tend to be more conservative. Yeah, and there's also the idea of pride, the idea of pride, like in the kind of mythological image of like the devil falling from heaven, you have a sense, you have these images where it says things like, you know, there's a jewel in his forehead, like this, Im this images of the, of the highest angel falling. And so th there's a notion also that the first, the, the sin of the first or the danger of the first mm -hmm. is pride, right. right? So even St. Peter, Christ says, you know, it's like, you're the foundation and then get behind me, Satan. And every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou wilt not redeem it, that's a substitutionary uh, <coughs> yep. sacrifice. Yeah. Then thou shalt break its neck. So you have to give it up. And all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. You have to make a sacrifice. And it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What is this? That thou shalt say unto him, By strength of hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of bondage. I guess a sacrifice of like that too, that is definitely something children would remember. Yeah. Because a sacrifice that involves blood and death is not something that you would easily forget. Yeah. So it marks the importance to put something to death for something, definitely marks its importance. And modern people can barely understand that because we're so abstracted away from death. And, you know, not that that's <laughs> in all ways such a bad thing, but, and it shall be that when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, what is this that thou shalt say unto him? By strength of hand, the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all that opened the matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children, I redeem. Yeah. But I think it's important, at least for me, this passage is very important because I, in, the, in the, the days, preceding days, I tried to say that there's a dis 
clear link between the death of the Egyptians and the sacrifice of the firstborn. And I think this passage shows it very clearly. It says, when your children ask you, say, God killed the firstborn of the Egyptians. Now, therefore, you sacrifice your firstborn and, and you redeem them. But there's a relationship between a cl- in the text. Clearly. And you redeem them with a substitutionary yeah. sacrifice. And I think that that has to do with this idea that if you voluntarily give up, then God will let the world exist. God, God, that's how the world exists. And so God gives it back to you. There's a, um, I wanted to say something about sacrifice, because uh, there's a sense in which you can read this as if, I don't know, God is taking away something that's yours. Um, my wife Anne and I had an experience, I hope it's all right to share kind of a personal story recently with long wanted children, but not blessed with children and sort of getting beyond the childbearing years. And anyway, suddenly uh, my wife became pregnant and uh, a test and then another test and went to the doctor and still, indeed, there there it was. Uh, it seemed a miracle. And then the next week, an ultrasound and there's a heartbeat. And it just seemed just this miracle. Um, the next week, the heartbeat was gone. There was no, you know, no, what that life that had been was, was gone. Of course, it's very sad for us. Um, but I was just so thinking about this, you know, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. I mean, we have no right to children. So children are a gift. Uh, we have no right even to our own lives in a way. Even our own lives are a gift. And so this notion of sacrifice, really, it's just giving back what you were given already. It's, it's not, uh, it's not as though you make a deal with God in some way that you, know, you give him what was yours, a little bit of it, or the best of it. No, 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 no. You're only giving back to God what was God's. Mm-hmm. That's I want, nice. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say, I want to say something here. I, I've been trying to avoid too much, let's say, doing the Christian parallel, but I think because Passover for the Christians is extremely important, Pascha is the, the main feast of the Christian church. And I'd like to just point to how Christians have brought this into their story, both in a very different way, but in ways that are connected directly to the story. <clears throat> and so on Passover, Christ offers the bread and the blood. The, the, the bread and the blood of the Passover uh, on the doors of the lintel become the, the, the wine that Christ offers as his blood and the bread that Christ offers as well. And the difference is that in the Passover of the Christians, there's only one firstborn that dies, right? And that is Christ. And that is very strange because he is the sacrifice. He offers his, the, the bread and the blood as the Passover sacrifice. And then when the Spirit passes, he is the only one who dies. And so that is the manner in which we understand the, the finality, let's say, of the, of the Passover sacrifice as 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 being that so it's it's he he is both the the redemption the protection and the firstborn in a very strange way almost as the egyptian child that gets taken but also as the self offering uh, because he is killed by the the stranger he's also the the the, the egypt the, the israelite thrown into the river he's all those things kind of captured together because he's killed by the romans right the romans are in the story of jesus at the time of jesus like the egyptians mm-hmm. and so he's both self offered but also killed. He is the, the, the one who protects on the door, but is also the redemption sacrifice for all of us. And so it all, all the symbolism like crashes together in ways that just, that is hard sometimes to fully account mm-hmm. for. Like even now, I know that I'm missing elements because the, it, just, it, just, it just seizes you. Well, it is, a, I mean, at minimum, speaking secularly, it's a centralizing narrative, right? It's an attempt by the narrative imagination to bring all the elements of historical narrative into one right. place, whatever that means. And yeah. God only knows what that means. And it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all that opened this, the matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlets between thine eyes. I do not know what that means. That's tefillin in Jewish history. That's the, the boxes that you see on religious Jews when they pray, the black box at the forehead and the black box on the arm. 
They each contain uh, a portion of the Torah on parchment in those boxes. There are two examples of this. This is called tefillin. In English, it's phylacteries. I never met any human who knew what phylacteries was who didn't know what tefillin was. So it's a, a useless translation. <laughs> but that's what it is. It's those I boxes. See. So this is another injunction to remember. Yes, but uh, the proof that it's physical because some... Jews have taken it as metaphorical, and many Christians have taken it as metaphorical. Christians don't wear tefillin, obviously. Uh, it took me a while to realize, and you don't know this until you're in Deuteronomy, it follows the law of the mezuzah, the, uh, what you put on the doorpost, which is also a parchment of the Torah. Mm -hmm. So there is uh, a mezuzah on your body and a mezuzah on your doorpost. This is the mezuzah on your on your body. Okay, so this is an this is an instruction to remember. So then you might think, well, you're remembering here the spirit that brought you out of tyranny. When we're enjoined upon to never forget the Holocaust, are we enjoined to never forget the Holocaust? Or are we enjoined to never forget the spirit, the nature of the spirit that overcame the Nazis? Like, what's the proper remembering there? That's it. It's my my answer will disappoint you, but I think it's to remember the horror, because we don't want to. Free, it's really remember the six million. I know that, that's that, I know that, that's how it's construed. That's how right? it's construed. Well, there's right, no but then obviously then the there's problem no Torah is you're, law with regard to the Holocaust. You're stuck in the atrocity of the past. Then that's the and I, I, so then I'm wondering is that is that the proper remembering in the biblical sense? Because what you're told here is in to some real sense is God took you out. It's that's a very, right. It's a great to, question. To remember I never the spirit of, of that which took you mm -hmm. out. You know? Well, I guess I guess. Jews aren't quite prepared yet, maybe over the course of generations, to say God took the Jews out of, out of Hitler's Europe. It's hard to say, given the staggering number who were murdered. Right. Well, I think it's a mistake not to, it's also a mistake not to remember the horror, because you also want to appreciate the depths of the tyranny. Right. And then if something How could, if something could overcome could even that, what must it be? I, I, I like, I think we should remember both. You, you, you've affected this Jew. Uh, yeah, it's a very powerful point. Well, you know, I start, spent a lot of time studying the Holocaust, and what I learned from it wasn't the misery, mm -hmm. although I learned that. Mm -hmm. It was that something overcame the misery. And what was it that overcame the misery? Well, that's what we're all trying to figure out, Dennis. Really. I mean, really. That's what we're all trying to figure out. Well, the whole injunction was, remember, so it doesn't happen again. Okay, remember what? Remember the misery? Or remember, remember the spirit of Solzhenitsyn, or do you remember the spirit of Viktor Frankl, right? Do you, is it, what is what, is what we're remembering that which enabled us to overcome the tyranny and the malevolence? It's got to be that, because we can't just remember the well, terror. It was allied tanks that overcame the tyranny. Yeah, well, that's also something, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah.